Hello and welcome to the class of 2020 Creative Writing Senior Reading. This event is so special and so important and we're really excited that we can share it with you, um, even if that sharing is a virtual sharing of these amazing students and their amazing words. Um, due to restrictions of COVID-19, it was um, possible for us to stage a live reading, which is what we usually do. And so instead, what you're going to see tonight is a compilation of videos that students have submitted of them reading in their own homes, um, recorded on their cell phones or on their computers or by a family member. Um, and they are going to be reading from their portfolios, their senior portfolios, um, which is the final culminating project of their senior year. And these portfolios, um, they work tirelessly on. It is the, the biggest project that they've, they've ever really completed. Um, they're upwards of 80 to 100 pages of their writing and of their reflection and of their um, really thinking about who they are as writers and where they have come in these past four years um, and who they have grown into. So you are going to see, again, the the writers tonight reading pieces from these portfolios that they've chosen that they're our favorites. Um, and they'll be introducing them and giving you a little bit of background that you might need in order to make sense of, sense of the pieces that they're reading. Um, and you also hear them reading their acknowledgements and their acknowledgements are thank yous to the people who have helped get them here to this moment, as crazy as this moment actually is. Um, but it, it takes a lot to, to make an artist and to, to help an artist be an artist. And, and these people have been there for them, you know, through the ins and outs, the ups and downs, through the writer's block, through the, the, the wins, the victories, through it all. So it's really important that they have that moment in time to thank them and to acknowledge them. So we really hope that you enjoy tonight's reading. And what's kind of lovely about a virtual reading is that if you just can't get enough, you can go back and you can watch it again. So um, these writers are my favorite, my favorite words, my favorite stories, my favorite poems. And I hope that you um, will feel the same after listening to their, their brilliance tonight. So Without further ado, I am going to introduce our first reader, and our first reader is Sean Callahan. And Sean Callahan is as kind and loving and wonderful as he is tall. <laughs> and he is always there to boost the morale of the class and to, to provide levity when we need it. Um, he has been amazing through this whole quarantine and has worked so, so hard. And he deserves all of the accolades for everything that he has done. So I hope that you enjoy his words as much as I do. And again, congratulations, class of 2020. You've done it and here you are. Happy reading. I wrote this poem my junior year. It's about my father and it's titled More Light Than the Eye Can See. Today and tonight is your birthday. I'm sitting on the floor talking to a candle or God or angels or the universe or you or a mirage of everything in existence. It's how our time together is measured in too many one-sided conversations and too few I love yous. It's found in the length and width of wax streams hourglass strands staining this relic, this reminder of your untimely trip to heaven, or the smoke that rises from the burning wick. I've been sitting with you longer in your death than I have sat with you in your entire life. I don't know if this is my fault, if me watching this candle melt is akin to letting it die, if me hearing nothing is me closing you out. Maybe the memories swimming in my mind have agreed that this pool is too, too small for mourning. Sometimes it feels like the smoke rising to the ceiling is the presence of God or spirits or you. Other times I remind myself that it is just smoke and this is just a candle. This is the beginning of a fiction story written my junior year. Everything you need to know about the plot is found in the title, How to Apologize to Your Brother. Start at home in your room upstairs with a pen and paper at your desk. 
Leave jealousy and contempt outside to soak in the rain. You don't need them. Guard the doors to the frontal lobe of your brain. Open them only for honesty, for the guilt you feel for hurting your brother. When you sit down to find the right words, listen to the beating of your heart, even if the idea makes you laugh. Shoot for a page. He'll like the dedication. When you can't make that, try half a page. He always said quality over quantity when he helped you with English, months ago before he stopped saying anything at all. Before you dropped out of high school altogether, fed up with your failures and your brother's successes. When half a page is too much, write a paragraph. If not a paragraph, write a few sentences. One sentence, or maybe one phrase. Crumple the paper. I'm sorry is all that you've managed to write. Go for a walk. Grab the ripped sweatshirt hanging on the back of your door. Go down the steps and open the front door. Step over jealousy and contempt on your way out. Up next is an excerpt of a poem I wrote in my junior year, inspired by poet Dean Young. The format is a hundred statements, ranging from serious to absolutely ridiculous, all left to the reader to, to decide if they are true or false. This is true false after Dean Young. 45, everyone deserves a second and third and fourth chance. 46, Coke is superior to Pepsi. 47, you're never too old to have video game posters in your room. 48, Tom and Jerry today is better than it was in the 40s. 49, The Walking Dead needs to end. 50, I have never dreamed about the same girl three days in a row. 51, I don't think I could like her like that again. 52, the previous two numbers are false. 53, keep your friends close and your enemies closer. 54, last place deserves a trophy. 55, I think too much about the past. 56, I don't drink alcohol because throughout the world there are millions of people suffering from addiction. 57. I sleep with the fan on every day. 58. Right now, someone is in love with you. 59. The world will end when we least expect it to. 60. Heaven is a place on earth. 61. I want to be a priest. 62. I want to be an exotic dancer. 63. Aliens are watching us. 64. These aliens want to know what the hell is wrong with our people. 65. I lose myself in movies more than books. 66. Classy is always the answer. 67. Everyone wants to live to be in their hundreds. 68. Mother knows best. 69. I wish that I could be like the cool kids. 70. Tuxedos are cliché. This next piece shows the end of a fiction story written my senior year. The narrator is an 18-year-old boy who has undergone a physical, animal-like transformation in response to grief over his father's death in the military. He wants to join the military as well, but is worried about his mother's response. It's the narrator's birthday. In this scene, he has just lashed out at his mother and is going to the one place where he feels most safe. The title is the same as yesterday. I ran until I was at the graveyard, at his grave, just outside the first skyscrapers of the city and beside the last suburban neighborhood before the city. I sat by dad. 10 minutes passed. This time, I didn't hide behind my hood. I grieved as the fur melted off my face and hands, inch by inch. It floated into the air in little fuzzy flakes. I hated Benji, but I wish I hadn't done something so stupid. I was afraid Mom wouldn't accept me if I told her about my future, but I wish I didn't have to hide things from her. I wish things would be okay. Back when Dad used to come home during the summers. Back when he wasn't deployed. Back when I was sure I knew who my friends and family were. Back when I knew they understood me and what I wanted. I knew you'd be here. Mom stood beside me a few feet away. I kept hoping you wouldn't have to come here today. Thought I could avoid it, she said. I'm sorry I said that, Matt. I just want you to listen to me. I'll try to do a better job. I put my head against her shoulder, now free of the fur that captured my body. I held her rough, calloused hand in my clawless, sweaty hand. My fear and anger were slowly floating away of the last flakes of fur. Mom, there's something I have to tell you. She nodded. I know you do, but you'll tell me when you're ready. She put an arm around my back. There's cake in the fridge, you know. I think it's calling your name. This next piece is an excerpt of my nonfiction monologue, written during my sophomore year. The title is Mutually Assured Destruction. 
I don't care if he thinks there's nothing he can do about it. Why aren't the doctors doing anything about it? Why aren't they doing some experimental crap or giving him some other option? This is dad we're talking about here. My father. Doctors aren't paid to sit around and let patients die. But who am I kidding? <laughs> they probably don't have fathers to go back to anyway. Their fathers probably died in their sleep when the doctors were in their 30s. Their fathers saw them do track. Their fathers watched them get all A's for the first time. Their fathers saw them graduate, go to college, go to medical school, and graduate again. Mine won't even see me through middle school. So I don't think about it. I pull up a chair next to Dad and watch TV with them. This cancer commercial about St. Jude's Hospital comes on, and he changes the channel. But I'm still on that commercial. This next piece is an entry from my senior year nonfiction project, an encyclopedia of not-so-ordinary lives, in which I was tasked with writing three to five mini-essays about my life for each letter of the alphabet. The title is My Life Philosophy Captured in an Essay of Quotes. Ask not what your country can do for you, ask what you can do for your country. After all, to live is the rarest thing in the world. You only live once, but if you do it right, once is enough. It is easy to hate and it is difficult to love. This is how the whole scheme of things works. All good things are difficult to achieve and bad things are very easy to get. This is why I find it only partially true that the enemy of my enemy is my friend. Because coming together is the beginning. Keeping together is progress. Working together is success. If you want to see the true measure of a man, watch how he treats his inferiors, not his equals. If you judge people, you have no time to love them. This final piece for the reading is a large excerpt of a nonfiction essay written my junior year. It's written entirely in fragments. It's about coping with my father's passing, or as the title says, learning to release. You, there in the fifth grade, between the rusted swing sets and the air speckled with the scent of morning cow manure, clasping your fingers around the ribs of a football, wishing the sun on your shoulder was your father's comforting touch, surrounded by kids who crucify you with cackles and scornful looks, who mock the way your arms flop forward like a girl, who boo and criticize your zigzag throws and rocky spins and lazy twirls and downward spirals. For you, imagine them happy, easy. Imagining that at the end of the day, most of them go back to a father young enough and eager enough to pass them the ball. Nothing works. More two highs and two lows and floppy arms and failures. More tears and burning cheeks and invalidation. You are and this is and then it's not. Too soon. Too close, too much, not like them. Wrists the right angle, bodies with the right amount of bulk, all sports jerseys and baseball caps and quick feet, always with father behind them to guide their arms through the motions, things you never had, or things you thought you'd have forever. Because five years later, it isn't just wrinkles and old bones you lose him to, cancer, lurking deep inside his lungs, eating away at the promises he made to you what he tried and wanted, pushing aside the aging bones and the dying cells to teach you how to do more than throw a football, teaching you to cast a fishing hook better than he could, making sure you would know the thrills of King's Dominion roller coaster rides and ice cream cone stops on the way home, passing on the knowledge of all the things he learned before his father's heart stopped beating, hoping you could have enough reasons to tell your kids how awesome your old man was. Your father, here, with you, He's supposed to be, at least. To end this reading, I'd like to make a few acknowledgments. To Mrs. Anderson and Mrs. Fishow, my art teachers, my mentors, my celebrities, thank you for the best quotes and advice. Thank you for Kill Your Darlings and We'll Get It Done Bird by Bird. Thank you for Be Gentle, Your Learning. Thank you for giving feedback on stories as wordy as a science book. Thank you for listening to heart-to-heart -heart talks and check-in letters for extending deadlines, for making me a better writer than I was yesterday. A special word to the senior creative writers. I'm ashamed that I didn't get as close to you all as I am now. Regardless, thank you for becoming my friends, my confidants, and my workshop partners. It has been awesome to write beside all seven of you, to watch you guys grow as individuals and as artists. Thank you for going into Amanda, Sarah, Kat, Sullivan, Avon, Gracie, and Mina. Until next time, my friends. To my cousins, Emily and Kara, 
Thank you for being sisters to me and for being the support system I didn't know I needed. Thank you for all the days you screamed and sang without reason throughout the house. Thank you for the laughs over TikToks, for suffering with me during study sessions at the dining room table. Thank you to my aunt Anako for giving me a new life filled with new opportunities. Thank you for giving me my religion, my competence, my discipline, and my passion. Thank you for Thank you for supporting me in applying to Barb Ingram, for believing I can be a writer and a better person than I was yesterday. Thank you for bringing me to this moment, for pushing me towards the future. To my mother, my loudest supporter, thank you for constant phone calls and I love yous. No matter where I am, I know my mother is close. I know you are in my heart always. To my father, who might be gone physically but will not be gone forever, thank you for every minute you spent on earth with me for every day you spent fighting cancer, for reminding me that I'm still here with a purpose, kicking and fighting, for reminding me that you're always here with God, hands glued to my shoulder, even when I have trouble believing. And now, I'd like to welcome the next writer, one of the most powerful and amazing poets I know, Mina Fouch. I'm Mina. It's been difficult to be separated from my classmates and teachers this year, especially since it's my last. I've learned a lot of different things while in the creative writing department. How to form a sentence correctly, being one of them, and I'm forever grateful for the memories I've made in the grand. To All Women or A Chance to Change Thought is the, is the last poem I wrote my freshman year. And I will always remember this poem as the last one I've written because I got an A-plus on it. And that was the only A-plus I had ever gotten in poetry, ever. I remember as a freshman, I would read everyone else's poetry and be so astounded by how beautiful everyone was able to write. I thought everyone's caliber of writing was completely in a different ballpark than mine. I recognize now that it's normal to compare yourself to other people, especially as a writer, but I wish I hadn't tried so hard to be someone else. To all women or a chance to change thought. Look at your dainty palms. They form into lotus flowers in mid-June. What is not to love? Your body is the earth, a grounded sycamore. Arms are sunflower stems, feet are soiled cherry blossoms, kiss the sun. Step by the dark light of the moon, your shoulders are the ageless crescents. Love your stomach, a purified lily pad gone untouched by the rest of the world. Love your elbows, the backs of your knees, your ears and forehead. Girl of September, woman of maple trees and roads beds, take a look at yourself, the parts you'd rather not know. Forget about with one blink of a tree stump eye. They are the most precious parts of your mountain and valley, hill and plain, sloped and dandelion filled, ocean like body. Take these words and use them. Use them in all of their glory, believe them. Hang them high on top of your collarbones, paint them inside of your palms. July Dripping is a form poem where I talk about my father. This poem has more to do with reflecting on my childhood with him and the things that I miss about our relationship. And after the Sierra de Mulder residency, one of the most important things I've learned about writing is that the ideas never get old if you write about them by turning the crystal, or turning the perspective or approach that you're using. This piece is one of my favorites that I've written while in the department because of the form that it's in. July Dripping. When rain hits the roof of this house, I'm seven years old again, and thinking of my dad sleeping off his heart. Thinking of July drizzle, glory, and much more than just water, the way that it pitter patters makes my smile widen, no. Makes my body feel like a body that is just stretched. My hands touching the sunrise. My father is lying next to me. Snores waking up our whole town. I want to feel the same way I did when I was seven. Unaware that a good sleep meant worlds for my father. Meant no more nausea or hurt feeding off of his alcohol pores but me. My time under the rainfall. Groggy dad and now. I am ten years late but it will rain. And when it does, I will go back to Neverland. Neverland that I call Midspring, that reminds me of his bed head and his sleepy, unconscious, sprawled out body hung over the river that both of us call the Box Spring Mattress. And here, in this memory, he has his best dreams, the ones where he doesn't feel like dying. Know that under this roof, I used to feel complete with the thought of us dreaming in the same quiet house, but now we shove problems under the riverbed thinking we are fine. Now, we take for granted these once-in-a-lifetime treasures, and I will remember the now more than most of the Neverland listen. 
I am older now, so I know what it means when he says he is tired, and if I could make it all the way back to what once was, I would, but it will never be. So dad, let your addiction seep out of your broken skin. Let the venom rain out from within yourself. It will not be easy. It will not be clean, but you will be just like July. Storm Chaser is also a piece that I've written this year. I wrote this piece for the 20 Little Poetry Projects assignment for class, and I decided to write about my anxiety as it is a constant factor in my life. I was very weary about the form at first because I was worried about how it would translate to the readers. After some editing and advice, I was able to reconstruct this piece and make sure that I did the best job possible so that readers can find resonance within the words I've written. Storm Chaser. My anxiety is a hurricane, a natural disaster, the wind gives me whiplash as I stand in the eye of my thoughts. The past is spinning around my head in stop-motion animation. I hear them talking to me. And all at once, I am fed worry for breakfast, lunch, and dinner, the taste of metal and the smell of a burning house. I've locked my secrets in the attic, and in the midst of all of this chaos, I reach my hand out to hope. And when she leaves me hanging, I hold myself, freckled skin and puckered lips. These thoughts taste like cough medicine on a drunken tongue. They call my name in the depths of my despair, Hamilton Boulevard, Mina from the bathroom mirror, Mina from the box of broken memories, Mina from the trash can that holds my unfinished dinner, and maybe my anxiety is not the storm but instead the wreckage. I deal with grief by forgetting. Because of my anxiety, I know how to count to ten in Spanish, it's why I've never been blackout drunk. Never have I ever felt still enough to fight my slap-happy conscience because to be human is to self-sabotage and every cloud has a silver lining. This spinning parade of comfort, a terrific clash of love and loss on haunted kisses and a blithesome absence. I will ask God to grant me serenity to accept the things I cannot change. I will pray for lullabies instead of panic attacks that whisper honey in my mother's voice before she forgot how to speak in love letters. I will pull myself out of this tsunami as an untrained fighter in a modern day war. I will teach myself a love language on my own. I will yell into the hollow home of my worries like lo que no te mata, te hace mas fuerte, over and over and maybe then the monsters under my bed will disappear. I am stuck picking up the pieces of my rainfall waiting for the weather to cry out my name once more. I wrote to the girl who gets to love her during my senior year. The past few months have been really hard, as heartbreak has struck my life and I've been forced to deal with growing up and making good decisions. I've spent a lot of time thinking about the love that I've lost and dwelling in all of the things that I could have done better or the moments that I could have changed as if somehow me thinking about things in this way would have changed the outcome of this relationship. But I realize it's normal to deal with loss this way and I've been trying to think of it in a more positive light. To the girl who gets to love her. I have always been told that you cannot fight fire with fire, and after praying upon shooting stars and asking God to bring me my lover back, I have realized that this time, what they say is true. That if you set something free, and it doesn't come crawling back to you, leash attached, it was never yours to coddle, but sometimes I see her shadow on my unmade bed. Sometimes I will listen to a song where the lyrics fit perfectly within our puzzled love story. Sometimes I remember what made her giggle, smell her shampoo, see cars that look just like hers does, and I find myself asking why the memories haven't gone spoiled within my brain, even though she left me with a heart full of bullet holes. I have been told that it is okay to be angry at her broken promises, but most of the time when I think of her, I smile at her stupid humor, and the way she yelled loud, I love yous into the whipping wind from her father's truck, the cheese ball throwing contest where her six-year-old brother won, late night phone calls and the way she would sing me to sleep even when she couldn't, and I need you to know I let her go a while ago. This is not a plea, nor a convincing argument. The table has been set. I've learned how to attend a funeral of someone who isn't dead. I've mourned into the sunrise with the chirping birds only to hold holding only my empty stomach and chewed fingernails, I have kissed the plump lips of guilt, and I now know how heartbreak tastes. This is hope, a lighthouse signaling to another wholesome heart across deep and dark water. This is poetry for her next lover. This is all I have left to say, and I am screaming it from Mount Everest. Bruises, scars, broken bones, and punctured lungs. I hope you love her in flowers and Taco Bell burritos. I hope you love her in letters and Roses are red and violets are blue. In watching her practice her music, 
in blowing kisses to her golden-haired siblings and in going to her family's 4th of July firework extravaganza. I hope her grandparents tell you you're beautiful. I hope her dad makes you laugh. I hope her mom gets you to eat some weird vegan food. I hope you listen to her stupid stories. And I hope you ask her why her favorite color is blue. I hope you make her homemade gifts. I hope you tell her how important she is. Tell her how special she makes you feel. Tell her how important her smile is. How much you love when she stares at you like you are a box full of sapphire. Like you are the answer to everything beautiful. These are my acknowledgments. Mom, thank you for always letting me read you a piece of mine after I write it, even if you're busy. Thank you for letting me be a wild teenager, but for also making sure that I'm safe. For doing whatever you can to help me fight my depression. For being the strongest person I will ever know. Dad. Thank you for supporting our family. You aren't around much, but by now I've learned how your love works. Thank you for making me smile, for singing with me in our living room and for getting random French toast cravings, for showing me what being a good person is. Elin Poop, thank you for always making sure I'm okay when I'm sad, for giving me hugs and for letting me annoy the shit out of you, for keeping that one secret from mom because both of us really didn't think you could do it. You taught me so many life lessons and you were half my age. Thank you for being my little buddy. Gracie. Thank you for saying yes to sit next to me on the first day of freshman year and for sticking by my side for four years after that. For listening to Hannah Montana songs in your car and crying with me when I need it. For getting me through my hardest days. Thank you for always trying to lift me back up again. Nathaniel Lemon. Thank you for math, cl math class beagles and lemon jokes. For always telling me when I need to do better as a human being and for liking indie music. Thank you for always being honest with me. Thank you for laughing the way you do. You mean more to me than you will ever know. Madison. Thank you for being the only other Pisces I know for being an abundance of light and for giving me some of the best advice I've ever been given, for experiencing love the way I do. Nana and Grandpa, thank you for being proud of me no matter how small the accomplishment is. Thank you for seeing me as me and not the path you want me to go down. Thank you for being the most loving and caring people that I know. Ganny and Papa, thank you for continuously making me smile, for bonding over The Walking Dead with me, for cherishing the time that you have with me. Thank you for hounding Mom about getting a copy of my school photos and for always wanting to read my work. Summer, thank you for always making sure I'm okay for showing me what it's like to adventure and have fun, for pushing me out of my comfort zone when I need it. Thank you for always being there. Sarah, thank you for helping me with math whenever I need it, for reminding me how important I am and for showing me how to care for people the way you do because it's beautiful. Thank you for always inspiring me to be my best self. And to my fellow creative writing seniors, you never fail to impress me with how much talent every single one of you possesses. I'm so proud of each and every one of you for making it here. Thank you for always being a shoulder to cry on, for letting me get to know all of you personally because every single one of you is worth something spectacular and when the day comes that you accomplish your wildest dreams, I will be proud to say that I knew you for the poetic, caring, and beautiful people that you once were. With all of my love, be the person you want to be. Keep on existing. I now introduce a Reese's Peanut Butter Cup loving Starbucks employee with a good head on her shoulders most of the time. My best friend, a writer with a heart of diamonds and a passion for adventure, Gracie Hastings.